Fairly uncommon parts of tumoral injuries. The epidemiology is not really known, but most common are the tuberosity dislocations rather than the three part and four part. Once the glenoid engages into the humeral head posterolaterally, the deforming forces, the position of the limb, and the age of the patient uh, decide what kind of a fracture we are going to get. Uh, the posterior circumflex artery, which supplies the posteromedial calcar and the meta uh, of the metaphysis, also anastomosis in the humeral head. This injury always dictates AVM. And the dislocation, particularly, brings the vessel precariously close to the shaft, especially in neglected cases, we have to be very careful about this fact. Because the injury is severe, the signs and symptoms are far more profound. The ecchymosis is very profound. The bruise is very profound. So it's extremely important to be very careful with our examination, especially the neurovascular structures. Once we get our routine x-rays done, AP and the lateral views or the axillary views, I always go for a CT scan. CT scan particularly for four things. One, the type of uh, displacement of the tuberosities, the size of our tuberosities, and the comminution in the tuberosities. Next, I look at the glenoid fractures. Many, especially in the neglected varieties, we need to understand glenoid defects. The third thing is fractures of the humeral head. I always go for a, a Doppler study, especially if the case is of a three-part or a four-part fracture dislocation. It's useful to measure pulse on both sides. And whenever in doubt, always get a CT, a CT angiogram done. I'm going to discuss about whether there is a tuberosity dislocation, whether it's a three-part or a four-part fracture dislocation. In two-part fracture dislocation, commonest variety are the greater tuberosity than the lesser tuberosity and surgical, uh, surgical neck. Often, their uh, closed reductions uh, are successful in uh, greater tuberosity dislocations. The dislocation rate should be reduced in a very gentle manner, often under general anesthesia. There is always this, this, this dilemma that once reduced, will the greater tuberosity sit back into the defect? And when it seats, will it displace or not? So if the displacement is more than 10 mm, we always try to fix it. And if it is less than 5 mm, we always go for a conservative management. Between 5 to 10 mm, if the patients are young and active, we always tend to fix these fragments. It's useful to take x-rays in gentle external rotation, which will give us an idea or helps us to predict whether these fragments will tend to displace in the future or not. Fixation for large fragments is with a combination of plates and screws. We can all, it's always useful, like Vijay said, it's always an augmentation procedure. You always have to use, in, in spite of use plates, use some kind of a suture anchor or sutures and augment your fixation. Dr. Sundar sir will probably tell us about orthroscopy of fixation of these fragments in the following lecture. I always do cases in supine position, but B chair is particularly useful in three-part and four-part fractures where you need to convert these fractures into orthroplasties. It's very useful to understand the, the position of the CM preoperatively. Deltoid splitting approaches are always useful when the, for an isolated GT fixation. It should, you should be particularly sure that there is no surgical neck fracture because to insert plate again, it becomes difficult. So deltoid pectoral approaches are far more useful in fracture dislocations of humerus, particularly of the three-part and four-part variety. Uh, this case uh, is a two-part GT fracture dislocation. Close reduction under general anesthesia was done. The fracture seated back into the uh, defect. We did a conservative management. The patient had a fair result. This is a two-week-old fracture dislocation of the uh, two-part fracture dislocation. The biceps was uh, entrapped in the uh, defect. We, we had to remove, uh, get the biceps out and do a fixation. Uh, you can do a plate fixation also. Here we did uh, a screw fixation. The, um, in the subcontinent, we have a fair number of neglected varieties of fracture dislocations. In neglected varieties, you have to be particularly careful in uh, retrieving your fragments out. We shouldn't be very, very enthusiastic in holding the fragments with towel clips or cocker clamps because they, they tend to be porotic. It's always used to tag them with ethy bond at the, at the muscular tendinous junctions and use them like pull-out strand, pull uh, strands. You won't have a good radiology in neglected dislocations, but the function in Two-part fracture dislocation and the recovery will be reasonably better than three-part and four-part, especially when you opt for osteosynthesis. This is a neglected two-month-old bil bilateral fracture dislocation in an epileptic. Here, the fragment goes posterosuperiorly. You have to dissect subdeltoid, bring the fragments out, hold them together, and try to do a fixation. Avoid putting such kind of K-wires into the glenohumeral joints. 
because it is cumbersome, if, especially if they fracture. Use augmented fixations. Three-part, four-part uh, fractures, it's always useful to use this classification. There is this, this first variety where the capsule is intact, and uh, you have a very good medial hinge uh, of about more than two centimeters, commonly in young patients. And then you have this type two varieties where there is no capsule and there is no medial hinge, usually in older patients. The second variety usually will lead to AVN. But ensure that you get a good fixation, no cutout of screws. AVN will do reasonably well. The things to be assessed are viable, viability of the femoral head, capsular labral injury, porotic heads, all these things have to be kept in mind while during, uh, doing these fixations. There are no particular uh, um, uh, established reduction techniques in bringing out the head. Once you tag your tuberosities, you see the glenoid, the head will be stuck in the glenoid, uh, in anterior to the glenoid in the subcoracoid space. Now there are two scenarios. Either you have a head with a large metaphyseal spike, or you have a head which is wiggling around in a, in a space. It, it is very tempting to hold the metaphyseal spike, but don't hold on to it. Use a threaded K wire or a threaded sand spinner and be very gentle in bringing out the head because vascular injuries are very common. Once the head is brought out, most of the techniques are what Dr. Vijay or Dr. Nishikar have said. I will not go into the details of fixation of these uh, kinds of fractures. Just it is important, especially in the second variety where you have the fracture at the anatomical neck. Measure your uh, head scan, ensure you have very good screw length so that you have a good purchase. Once the union, even though there is AVN, usually they will do well, especially in, in osteosynthesis. So use the Hurtel's criteria. With the distal metaphyseal extension is less than 8 mm, there is disruption of medial hinge, or if there is fracture through anatomy connect, expect AVN and get a better fixation. Or plan for orthoplasty in older patients. This is a three-part anterior fracture dislocation. Whenever you are trying to do uh, an other screw, use extra screws over the plate, uh, ensure that they don't impinge. But as long as you do minimal soft tissue uh, damage, as long as you don't invade the medial part, you tend to get some callus and the fracture will unite. As long as there is no soft tissue uh, invasion, the, uh, the outcome of the procedures will be reasonably good. This is another case of three-part fracture dislocation, which was uh, two weeks old. Here there was a good medial hinge, we never touched it, so we got a good union. This is a four-part fracture dislocation. I, I always do a bicep stenotomy and uh, then bring in the tuberosities over the reduced head. After reduction, especially when there is an anatomical neck fracture, we tend to have a large metaphyseal void. It's always useful to build up that void with kind of a bone graft, allograft or autograft. This is a case of a four-part fracture dislocation. We, he had a substantial axial bruise, axillary bruise. He had a good radial pulse, but notice the head is deep inside the axilla. But we went in, did a good fixation. We had a reasonable uh, reduction of the tuberosities onto the, onto the shaft. We put some graft. There was no bleeding. We went on to close it. That was our fixation. Second post of day, the patient started having numbness and tingling sensation in the fingers and weakness in extension. We went in and did a Doppler and found a pseudo or the axillary artery. Then we have to call in our uh, vascular surgeon and ensure that we get a good uh, repair. The patient had some brachial plexus injury for about three months, which eventually recovered. Uh, the lesson learned is it's always useful to measure your pulse on both sides preoperatively. Even though you have a feeble pulse, plan for a Doppler and in doubt, get a CT angiogram. We are somehow presuming probably he had a developing in pseudoaneurysm, which wasn't detected there, which probably enlarged postoperatively. This is a two-year-old fracture dislocation of a neglected fracture dislocation. These uh, scenarios are fairly common. Osteosynthesis is out of picture. We, did, we went ahead and did a reverse shoulder orthoplasty. The surgical options are whether you're going to do an osteosynthesis, hemiorthroplasty, or a reverse shoulder orthoplasty. Indications for orthoplasty is risk of humeral head necrosis, impacted fracture of humeral head more than 40%, and always consider the quality of rotator cuff. Uh, Hemiorthroplasty works well if there is a good quality rotator cuff and in an younger patient where there is a comminuted head fracture. But by and large, these, uh, most of the surgeons have moved on into, rotator, uh, into reverse shoulder orthoplasty, especially if the age crosses 55 or 60 years. So replacements are particularly indicated in type 2 fractures in elderly, late presentations over three weeks, and age more than 65 years. 
So three limb guidelines are type one fracture dislocations on Ro of Robinson's classification. We always do an uh, osteosynthesis. In type two, especially in young patients, we always try to do osteosynthesis. Type two elderly, we go for a orthoplasty, preferably a reverse shoulder orthoplasty. So the conclusion is, the usually a tuberosity fracture dislocations tend to have good prognosis. Uh, pre -op proper, you have to do a proper pre-op planning on viability of the head, displacement of the head, and the combination in the tuberosities to get away good, with good osteosynthesis. Especially in neglected injuries, be careful with vascular injuries. Assess your vascularity well, plan, and then go in. Retrieve your head very, and be gentle in retrieving your head, and do not touch the medial structures or the posteromedial soft tissue. As long as the medial hinge, hinge remains undisturbed, your osteosynthesis tends to work well. Thank you.